Go ahead. In the name of Jesus, who gathers us in for this time of worship and praise, welcome to Westminster, an affirming ministry in the United Church of Canada. A hearty welcome to all of you who are here in person and with us online. If it's your first visit with us, I'll extend a special welcome to you. The land on which we worship this morning is land that has been walked on, hunted on, and lived on for thousands of years. It is the traditional land of the Anishinaabe and the ancestral territory of the Fort William First Nation. We acknowledge with gratitude the good stewardship of this land from generation to generation. And we are grateful today for the beauty and abundance around us. May we always remember the story of this land and our call to live upon it with respect, humility, and gratitude. We light our special candle to remember all of the children who suffered and died in Indian residential schools. Since we're on celebrations and announcements, you don't have to move the screen for a bit. Can you get the other mic from my desk? Okay. I can tell it just works better than this one. In the meantime, we'll start with celebrations. Um, I understand Marie McClellan had a birthday on uh, this past Wednesday. And Carol Dowhouse has a birthday today. Six today, and uh, Vicky is as young as she feels. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Better? Better. Better. Okay. Other celebrations. I see one here, Melissa. My dad's birthday today. Oh, it's Melissa's dad's birthday. Wish him a happy birthday for us. Okay, moving on to announcements, and bear with me, it's that season of the year where there's a few. Uh, Wednesday evening, Advent prayer services continue. Uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. on the Facebook page only, later on YouTube. Uh, don't come to the church, we're not doing anything here, it's all in my dining room. Uh, today is Stocking Stuffer Sunday, and you will see on the table over here all kinds of wonderful jams, jellies, and preserves all packaged up and ready for somebody's Christmas stocking. So if you're still looking for a few things that you want to get to uh, gift to people, um, there's your answer right over there. And all proceeds will go to Westminster. So, and uh, thank you, Janine, and everyone who helped make this possible today. A reminder that the thermometer is up on the wall over there um, to take a look at our financial goal and how we're doing in uh, 2021. And I meant to do it last week, but forgot. This week I will take a picture of the thermometer for the online church so that uh, our online folks will know as well. Christmas envelopes for any special Christmas givings are on the table by the uh, entrance. And Kim, are you going to announce Christmas Eve? Okay. Okay. Um, the thermometer, by the way, is just over $10,000, so it's about a third of the way to our goal. Um, Christmas Eve. So as usual, our service will be at 7 o'clock. There will be communion. There will be uh, faux candlelight, so not flame, um, but lots of candles. Um, this year, to be safe, to make sure that everyone is complying with our Westminster policy of uh, two doses of vaccination, we are asking you to reserve tickets ahead of time. Um, it's not, the ticket isn't as important as being signed up uh, so that we can just keep the flow moving at the door. So I have the tickets here. I have the sign up up at the front. Come on and see me at the, um, at the end of the service and we'll get everybody signed up who wants to be here. 
It may be that we fill and that we'll have to say that we are full uh, because we want everybody to be safe. So anybody who is watching or if you know people who usually like to come, uh, remind them that they can call the office or email Tammy to get some tickets. They have to have, uh, they have to show us proof of two doses of vaccination and we'll all be in masks, of course, to keep everyone safe. So tickets for Christmas Eve this year and we're already up to about 60. So people are, people are jumping on them quickly. Pass that to Jamie. Yeah. Okay. To go up there. Um, just an update from last week's basket sales. Melissa and I are really pleased to announce that we made one thousand six hundred and two dollars. And we just want to thank everyone for their donations to the baskets um, and then everyone who made such wonderful donations purchasing the baskets. So thank you so much to everybody. And thank you, Jamie, to you and Melissa for all the organizing and the work of uh, bringing all that together for us. Thank you. <laughs> did I miss any announcements? I don't believe I did. Well, let's celebrate God's presence in our midst. Let's worship. Today we light the candle of joy. We await the joy of the angels as they sing out, Gloria, Hallelujah. This Christmas, as we come nearer to the manger, may our joy be radiant, shining God's great love in and through us. God, God is our joy. In this season of watching and waiting, we trust in God to light our way. As we await the birth of the in the manger, God's joy surrounds us.
Wow, thank you, choir. That was wonderful. Okay, just a very short uh, story time before the children head downstairs. I found out this week something I didn't know. It was in the year 1212, and St. Francis of Assisi was the first to tell the story of Jesus' birth with the help of a nativity scene, using animals, of course. He did have a love for animals and birds and things in nature. And that's all fair enough because it said, of course, that Jesus was born in a manger, which is, um, it's a trough, it's a kind of bowl that's raised to just the right height for the animals to eat the feed out of it. Um, our cats have a raised bowl, but it's not a trough, it's a bowl. Um, and it's just so it's more comfortable for them to get the food. So that was where Jesus was born, it was a barn with animals in a feed trough. And over the years, of course, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, the angels, the wise men were all added as a way to tell the whole story of Christmas in one stable. Now you can see right in front of me here on the table, uh, in front of the communion table, this is our uh, nativity scene that we've used here at Westminster for as long as I've been here and for many, many years before that. It was made by a member of Westminster. Her name was Susan Starling. It was made many years ago. And when I look at each of these characters every year, I think about the skill and the care taken by Susan as she created them. If you've never looked at all the characters close up, I encourage you to do that. It's really, really fine work. And I think about all the joy through the years that her beautiful nativity scene has brought to all of us. And every year, it brings us that joy. And we're grateful. So I'll invite the children to go downstairs now for their uh, crafts and their time together. Okay, I'll invite uh, Kathy to come in and share our readings now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our Hebrew reading for this morning is from Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Today's Gospel reading is Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, from the Message Translation. When crowds of people came out for baptism, because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skin is going to deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming that Abraham is your father. Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if he wants. What counts is your life? Is it green and flourishing? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. The crowd asked him, then what are we supposed to do? If you have two coats, give one away, he said. Do the same with your food. 
tax men also came to be baptized and said, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, No more extortion. Collect only what is required by law. Soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He told them, No harassment, no blackmail, and be content with your rations. The interest of the people by now was building. They were all beginning to wonder, could this John be the Messiah? But John intervened, I'm baptizing you here in the river. The main character in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom, a fire, this Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. There was a lot more of this, words that gave strength to the people, words that put heart into them. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. was a cheerful gospel lesson, wasn't it? <laughs> Come to that in a minute. The third Sunday of Advent is traditionally called Rejoice or Joy Sunday in the liturgical calendar because it's a day when we anticipate and celebrate delight. God's delight in us and our delight in God's goodness and grace revealed in Jesus. Now I'm going to focus my reflection today on the letter to the Philippians because, let's face it, John the Baptist and his accusations to his listeners calling them a brood of snakes is a bit much for a day when we lift up joy. The one part of our gospel, though, that resonates with me is where John says, what counts is your life. Those are words to live by. Otherwise, I think we'll leave John to yell at his friends in the wilderness for now, um, though I suspect we will come back to that very passage uh, when we mark the baptism of Jesus in about a month's time. For now, though, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippian church, encourages them to rejoice in the Lord always. 
It's a wonderful sentiment. But it feels a bit prescriptive to me, a bit too much like an order rather than a form of encouragement. Joy, it seems to me, is not something you can be asked to feel. It needs to bubble up from within you, from a more intuitive, authentic, and natural place. Being asked to be joyful is a bit like being asked to smile more. If you don't mean it, it's a bit less than authentic. If the biblical instruction to rejoice no matter what strikes a sour note, especially given what's happening in the world right now, I don't think we're alone in that. Anyone who experiences the Christmas season as something to be endured rather than celebrated will tell you how difficult enforced joy can be. Now remember a few weeks ago when I told you about the, what I thought about the difference between hope and optimism. I think today we look at the difference between joy and cheerfulness. Both are good, both make life better, but they're different in subtle ways. Joy, like its counterpart hope, somehow runs deeper within our own spirits. It's more complex, and it's more grounded in our belief that whether we smile or whether we weep, God is there with us. Come back to those complexities in a moment. But by contrast, being cheerful is relatively easy. An example, you've had a bad day, a really bad day, but you don't want to burden anybody else with it. So instead, when you come home, you take a deep breath and intentionally set all that stuff aside, knowing you'll deal with it later. But for now, you open the door, you give your loved ones a hug, and you say cheerfully, now, tell me all about your day. I want to hear everything. Your bad day still happened. Deep down, you might still feel a bit low about it, but you made that decision to set it aside just for now in order to show some cheerfulness to the people around you. Now, the bonus gift of that kind of cheerfulness is that your own conjured enthusiasm may actually cheer you up. Now, in fairness, that's just an example. It doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. Some days you need to step in the door, hug your loved ones and say, I had a terrible day. Can I tell you about it? The reason I give this kind of intentional cheerfulness as an example is that the letter to the Philippians was written by someone who might have been doing exactly that. The Apostle Paul's letter with his advice to rejoice always is written from prison while he awaits trial and likely death. Paul is not a happy, joy-filled person saying to the church, don't worry, be happy. Rather, he's a man who is threatened, rejected, beaten, and shipwrecked. He's a man of faith who's haunted by his violent past. He's a man living like everyone else in first century Palestine, under state-sponsored, oppressive Roman rule. Paul is no Pollyanna preacher, minimizing the struggles of the, the early church. It's clear that Paul's words here are not about feeling good as much as they are about nurturing the inner life of the soul. He is able, despite his situation, to conjure up some cheerfulness for the early church. You see, in Paul's view, peace and joy, genuine joy, are not necessarily emotions we can conjure ourselves. They come from God, 
And the only way we can receive them is through consistent spiritual practice, prayer, gentleness, and contemplation. So I wonder if that's what he's telling his friends in the church. I wonder if that's what he's saying. That you need to pray and contemplate and work at real joy. Real joy requires putting aside sentimentality and cynicism alike. It insists that we hold those two realities at once. The reality of the world's brokenness in one hand and the reality of God's love in the other. Joy is what happens when we live into the belief that God can and will bridge the gap between the world we long for and the world we see before our eyes. Joy is a spiritual practice. It's a willingness to sit gently but persistently in the tension of those two realities, trusting that God's peace will guard your hearts and your minds in that in-between place for as long as it takes. Joy is what bubbles up in our watching and our waiting as we make our way toward Bethlehem. May the joy of the season be with all of us, and may God's name be praised. Amen. As is our new way of doing things, you may have noticed the offering plate on the table by the entrance and left your offering there, if so, thank you. If not, you can do so on the way out. And of course, thank you to everyone who uh, gives by car or e-transfer. I just want to tell you a short story about a, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, uh, the Reverend Lisa Waits. She and her family have a tradition that I thought I'd like to share she also, by the way, has a, she's a musician with a degree in sacred music and wrote the lyrics for our sung response to the Advent candle lighting. So Lisa worked for six years in community college chaplaincy. And during that time, she discovered a gap in the holiday toy drive and food collection hampers. And that was young adults between the age of 15 and 20. They were often missed especially the, the slightly older in that age group who were attending college or university. Too old for toys, and while not in local shelters, they were often desperately in need of some food. Many of the students in the residence couldn't afford to travel at Christmas. Some were international students, but not all. For some, money was just too tight for them to get home for the holidays. So Lisa and her family started a tradition. Instead of buying gifts for one another, 
They make up 20 stockings for people in need who are in that age category. She asks around at the college and the university and nearby high schools to see who might need that kind of help at Christmas time. And the stockings include fun things, as stockings should, but also practical items like gift cards for groceries. And the best thing about Lisa and Jeff's tradition is the true joy that it brings them. They love to see the looks on the faces of the young people when they see that somebody has made them a Christmas stocking. It's a lovely, generous thing that they do, and it's a good reminder of the joy of giving. Let's dedicate our offering for this morning. Let's pray. God of mystery, we give you our wonder. God of promise, we give you our trust. God of life, we give you our lives. Bless the gifts we bring and use them to be a blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. Before we turn to our prayer, I'll just remind you that uh, our prayer shawl ministry is still active. We have some packed up and ready to go at, in the back corner. If anyone in your life would be blessed by a prayer shawl, by all means, feel free to take one. Um, just sign on the clipboard to say you've done so. And for those in, in our online congregation, uh, just contact the church office if anyone you know might uh, be helped by one of our prayer shawls. Tomorrow marks one year since Helen Wheeler, a member here at Westminster, passed away. So we remember her family in prayer today. Prayers please also for uh, Jim and for Lori who continue to recover from their surgeries. For Jason, Esco, for Sarah, and for Catherine. And for Roberta's cousin John, who is doing really well this week, and we celebrate that and continue in prayer as he heals from his uh, transplant. Are there other requests this morning? Carol? family of Bill's cousin Marin who died recently and also for Carol's uh, neighbor who's recovering from surgery. Betty? Today's my brother's memorial service so uh, just have the prayers for him and his family. Prayers also for uh, for Betty's brother David, right? Right. Yeah, for Betty's brother David, the memorial services today. We hold you all in our prayers. Beth? Yeah, prayers for my neighbor Lisa. She's 95. And she's trapped. She's and she's moving to McKellar Place and very unhappy. She didn't feel very well. There's a lot of For Bev's neighbor, Nita, um, who is moving from her home, uh, from her apartment across from, uh, from Bev into McKellar Place, and she, it's not a happy move for her. I'm sorry to hear that. Don. How many American families affected by that tornado that just ripped through all their states? Yeah. For all our uh, neighbors in, in the United States who are uh, just, I can't imagine how they feel, for all those tornadoes that just blew through and, and just tore up so many lives, for all the families of the people who have died, and for everyone who just has to start now rebuilding. We take these prayers into our hearts and minds and spirits as we move into the week ahead of us. So you'll find our pastoral prayer on the screen this morning. So we're, we're combining the Lord's Prayer with our prayers. So you're invited to follow along and respond whenever you see the full print. Our Father and Mother and Beloved Parent in Heaven, hallowed be your name. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting One, Prince of Peace, hallowed be your name. Christ, our brother, you came to earth 
to a lowly manger to bring all creation into your embrace and draw us into your holy and perfect presence. Emmanuel, God with us, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. No? No, it's your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Prince of peace, make your kingdom complete. May we prepare for your kingdom. Wherever there is violence and hatred, wherever there is oppression and injustice, wherever there is quarreling and alienation. May we prepare a way for your kingdom of peace, where the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the kid. In us, through us, and around us, your kingdom come. Give us today our daily bread, bread of life, Feed us with your truth. In a season of greed and selfish desires, may we see that we are sustained only by your providence. May our eagerness to open our gifts pale in comparison to our joy in receiving the gift of your love and your blessing. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God, our lives are filled with ethical and moral struggles. We need you, not to remove our wrongdoing so much as to guide our way toward making good choices that are life-giving and healthy for all. And when we do fall short of our best choices, help us to learn and grow from it. For our worry and our scurrying this Advent season, forgive us. For the way we make this a season of shopping rather than waiting, forgive us. For our indifference to the wonders that are right in front of us, forgive us. Come to us, Jesus. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Protect us from the constant dangers enticing temptations we face every day. Deliver us from the oppressive influence of apathy, addiction, and abuse. Strengthen your church for the work of the gospel. Comfort all who are suffering in their bodies, minds, or spirits. Give them health and peace to sing of your power. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Word who became flesh and lived as we live, we have seen your glory, full of grace and truth. We join with all the communion of saints through the ages, and with the angels singing their joyous praise as we offer you blessing and honor and glory and might forever. Amen. Amen. prophet Isaiah said, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. 
the mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There will be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us this day and every day. Amen.